Thank you very much, Sandy. First of all, thank everyone to come to the seminar. <laughs> and uh, as Sandy mentioned, and uh, in my topic will be focused on small business and uh, ro wo a role of work from home in COVID. And it is a collaborative work between you know, me and my two of my good friends and colleagues, and Dan Golosky and uh, uh, Zoltan. Okay. Uh, let me see. All right, so talking about work from home, we are all very familiar as that's part of the privilege of being a scholar, right? So uh, <laughs> we all know about work from home very well. And uh, even if um, different data sources might show different work from home rate in America, like census um, uh, measure tend to be a little bit lower and some private measures tend to be higher to surveys. However, one story stays same is in over the past 10 years, the work from home rate has changed vastly. And this story has become further changed, distorted in with the COVID-19 started as one of the widely cited um, research on this topic is from Dingo and Neiman, published a little bit earlier this year. And they use the OES data and find that 37% of US jobs can be performed entirely at home, varying um, by cities and industries. And Bartik, Alex Bartik, actually also a colleague from UIUIUC, um, no, noted that 45% um, of the firms have at least some workers switched to work from home during the pandemic. And over a third of them believe they will remain work from home after the COVID-19. And Gallup panel in 2020 find a similar story. Um, work from home rate doubled in, in the uh, mid-March to early uh, April this year. And 56% prefer to go, uh, staying work from home, while only 41% will prefer to go back to office in, after the COVID-19. So um, we see the, all the rising of the work from home. And, but also another story about it is the work from home tend to be more privileged for certain occupations, certain industries, as well as more frequent in larger companies. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the bigger story here is about uh, how about the small businesses? They are most vulnerable in crisis, you know, we, as, we, as we know historically already. And also there are 50, almost 50% 50 of American workers work in small businesses. And so since they're more vulnerable and also they tend to be less frequently to use work from home for multiple reasons, then um, what this work from home wave would affect small businesses. Therefore, here's my two major research questions. One is whether work from home will become a new norm. And, you know, so of course we don't know, we don't have the data for after COVID-19 yet, but uh, we do have some data with some policy uh, variables there. So our first question is whether work from home rate will continue to rise after controlling for pandemic severity and related stay home order, the stay home um, mandate. And the second question is whether work from home helps or affects small business do better in the pandemic. So we started with some um, basic, um, you know, production function. As we all know, the, uh, the GDP is a function of the capital, uh, labor, um, tech, you know, and time. The, the labor is a function of the worker skills and technology and their work time. And also the land is a very important factor of production as well as entrepreneurship. So um, based on the utility maximization theory and uh, you know, our business would choose work from home versus brick and mortar office if the marginal revenue um, ratio with the marginal cost is larger. So therefore, um, from the variable cost of variable uh, marginal revenue per perspective, so a, a, a business would have, you know, uh, have the v marginal revenue come mainly from the labor. So the skills of the labor make make difference. Skill is a function of technology and the uh, work time is very important. So skill and time together would make the marginal revenue. Why the marginal cost side were including the earnings, capital, and land cost. So this the left side form for the work from home, while the right side for the office. 
and the from the face-to-face um, -face work or well, the office work another important factor is agglomeration as regional scientists we all know about that right so um so if a bit a bit of business would choose work from home if the the marginal revenue divided by marginal cost on the left side is larger or, or uh, is, is larger than the uh, marginal revenue divided by cost from the uh, the uh, uh, regular uh, traditional office perspective so when we rearrange we easily see this in equation and uh, you know for from the first vector that's a skill vector so we see that you know skill for the work from home typically uh, divided by uh, skills from the office workers tend to be larger than one that's mainly because you know so for work from home for the remote works you know their remote jobs there is a much larger labor search pool so the labor supply is is more and a skill set could be uh, could could have a, a, a more selection compared to the demand. So so therefore the skills for work from home typically tend to be larger or better or has better fit possibility than work for, uh, than the traditional office skills. For the time wise, you know there are quite some empirical studies find that work from home um, workers tend to work longer. And also another uh, uh, potential reason behind it is when people work from home, they tend to um, re 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 reciprocate that is as a um, privilege. Yeah? compared to other workers who do the same job who has to come to the office so therefore they 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 want to reciprocate that privilege you know with your special flexibility you know, autonomy and commute choices with longer working or even on the other hand possibly a better productivity in a sense Although the productive activity argument is controversial, but the longer working hours is being uh, shown consistently in the literature. And as for of earnings, um, we know typically, you know, when if you have the same job and you have the option to work from home, as you and I probably know that already, right? We were willing to sacrifice some pay, which is very uh, verified from from a 2017 study that that showing even quantitatively the workers typically from the survey willing to give up eight percent of wages for option to work from home. Okay, and for the capital wise, this is could be could go either way. Okay, from utility perspective, the traditional office, of course, you need to pay for all kinds of utilities, you know, electricity, you know, water bills, and so on. While you work from home, from the employer standard, they stands point, they don't need to pay for that, right? Um, for the office supply, work from home could cost less than work for in the office. However, you know when uh, business work started work from home, they particularly if they predict, uh, traditionally or previously do not have work from home policy or technology, they will have to spend on the technology to facilitate work from home. If they have security data, that could be even more costly, right? So, and also there is institutional change, organizational change, how to accommodate workers work from home. So therefore that cost could go either way. You, you, in the traditional office could cost higher from the capital perspective and, you know, and but also there's possibility work from home could be high it depends on what kind of industry how much that would be although in the COVID-19 period work from home could cost less mainly because the social distancing needs and also PPE cost and a constant testing and so on so um, COVID-19 could be a very special oh okay I heard a little bit of echo Somehow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry for that thing. I guess someone did not mute. Uh, Eduardo, do you mind uh, to mute everyone and then just lifting? To... Uh, I, th I think. So. I have a red mood. Okay. 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 Go, go <laughs> Thank <on>. you. <laughs> I, I think we're all fine. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so, so yeah, so the, in the COVID-19 period, uh, but the capital cost of work from home would be relatively lower. Um, but after COVID, that could go easy way. However, even if that could go easy way, it's the, the, the cost of difference might not be that huge. So maybe, you know, a little bit over, uh, over one, maybe twice, three times at the most. What is more dramatic here is a land cost. If if a, if a company has office, of course, we all know they have to pay for the rent, right? Month to month. And the commercial real estate is quite expensive, particularly in good location. And 
why if a work work from home like a lot of insurance company actually are having have been doing that for a decade for a decade already what they did is all the you know like financial workers or nurses they all work from home and they purchased all the equipment for them but the you know insurance company they don't need to pay for the real estate cost for those workers they have a lot of nurses all through the other uh, country a lot of financial workers you know, they work from home so so the land cost will be huge so on the um real estate is expensive on the other hand for employers for workers work from home the land cost marginal cost for per worker is zero or close to zero so therefore the ratio become proxy to positive infinity and compared to everything else added together so the all the, all the left side starts to become very huge so you know unless the uh, a pro, an agglomeration factor is also close to positive infinity which we know agglomeration is important, but whether they can reach a positive infinity, I doubt that could be the case, right? So therefore, the left side most likely will be larger or uh, larger, at least the equals to one. In that case, you know, so um, based on utility maximization, and we believe there is rationale for business to um, promote work from home policy. And so our first hypothesis is stay home order about stay home order mandate. So we believe after controlling for local pandemic, economic and demographic conditions, the work from home probability would sharply drop after the stay home order ended. The reason for, for that, you know, partially from the earlier, we, we used the basic theory to see work from home has rationale there and is probably a rational choice for small businesses. And also more importantly, after the pandemic or after uh, people adjust to work from home in the pandemic for a while, the fixed costs paid on learning how to telework is already paid. And, and also the awareness enhanced. Actually, one of our co-authors, Zoltan, uh, in, during the, uh, in, in early March, and before actually I started thinking about it, this paper, he actually complained, you know, um, work from home is uh, teaching online. It's a pain, you know, because everything you want to write on the board, a whiteboard in the real, real, real classroom for discussions, not easy to do. So that was, that was complaining at yeah, that moment. He used the word horrible, I remember very clearly. And by the time we developed the paper, he actually totally agreed. He said, actually, he initially thought it was horrible, but later on he found it is, is fun. Because he said, he said, hey, I could teach why vacationing. Awesome. <laughs> so, so that's awareness enhanced. Um, I, I think many of us as scholars probably feel the same way. After awareness enhanced, a lot of more people would like to switch to work from home if they have choice. And in same as, same as companies, after they realized that they could work from home, the story could be different. And on the other hand, even if this study is done, you know, uh, way before COVID-19, but, but the rationale still applies. You know, after people um, using, to, uh, adopt the technology and the telework uh, pr pr practice for a while, they probably, you know, f notice that they could overcome organizational inertia and you, uh, you know, um, reflect upon the viability of, of, of business models using the tel telework practice. So therefore, um, Bartik has a uh, uh, his little bit later, I believe, the uh, July research, and noted that forty percent of large and small business in their survey in both their uh, alignable and NABI surveys find that at least forty percent of workers are not going to switch back. So therefore, the you know, based on those, our hypo that's we given our hypothesis. Now, hypothesis number two is on uh, business performance. So we believe a higher work from home rate will help small business perform better in a pandemic with a lower probability of temporary closures, disruption in supply chain, with more operation revenues and with better cash flow. We know temporary closure is is important for the workforce, right? If a lot of business um, temporary closure, there's w workforce st stability will be a problem, and a lot of uh, work will be at least temporarily laid off. There could be permanent um, laid off, as we see already. 
and if if there disruption in the supply chain that would affect the economy as a whole and operation revenue revenue is typically used as a, a one basic measure for business performance and cash flow positions is important to see how um, how soon you know or, or the time to failure how soon a business would fail so therefore we use those um, four measures to capture the four different uh, dimensions and um, 40, um, as Bartek noted, in 43% of the small business in their survey, in temporarily closed already in the pandemic. And that's based on his uh, little bit, I think, April research. And, and, uh, and, and, and also, they are fragile in the, in, the, in the financing with only less than one month of cash flow um, on hand. That also shows how important to measure the um, temporary closure and cash flow. And the reason we believe work from home would help a business because first of all, work from home has saved the turnover cost. Quite, quite a few research cited here uh, noted that work from home can reduce the stress level and, and also uh, promote a work-life balance. Because of that, it enhances so, so, and, you know, the, uh, the in, enhanced workers' welfare in a sense. So therefore there's lower turnover. And also there's evidence shows the uh, work from home have elevated productivity. Although not every uh, study, it's been empirical studies agree that. A big rationale on elevated productivity argument is mainly related to less absenteeism, which is related also to the turnover cost as well. In the COVID-19 um, period, the work from home keep a, a predict productivity up. And we saw quite a study already show that the, the reason is, is quite clear. So therefore we believe work from home rate will help a small business perform better. Our empirical models, we um, basically uh, have two, mo two major base models. One model is using uh, dependent variable as work from home rate, uh, rate or prob probability. And the um, key ind uh, independent variable is uh, the policy variable, dummy variable actually, uh, whether it's after stay home order ended or not. And we control for the COVID severity on economic conditions, demographics. And we also um, add all kind of variety of models with industry controls, always not contest controls. And we uh, uh, used three different models to test the, 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 the same set of variables. We first of course started with fist effect models and uh, con considering there is some, um, you know, the correlations among um, states and within states and between states, we also used a um, um, population averaged GE model. And also adding, when we added the industry, we also used the two, two level mixed effects models to verify. And so, yeah, the top would be the, um, the fixed effect model and of uh, uh, the population average model, the, the bottom equation is for the um, multi-level mixed effects models. For our hypothesis number two, we just did switch gear for a test testing the effect on the small business performance. It's a performance measure including operation revenue, cash flow, temporary closure, and dis disruption in supply chain. And did our work from home rate lagged by one period would be uh, you know, would be the independent key independent variable controlling for the uh, or the um, pandemic, uh, economic demographic as well as financial assistance so such as paycheck protection, um, and and other assistance program. Those are our, uh, variables. As you can see, we draw the variable from various sources, right? For good things because of COVID-19. As scholar, you all know that a lot of those data become open source for us to use. So that helps a great deal. So work from home is our key measure. We measured by a percentage of workforce work from home. home that's from MTI measure. And typically the work from home is measured by with radius less than or equals to one mile from the home location. And the, the data is, is from the multiple sources from the mobile device location tracking. And after this uh, stay home order ended, that's from University of Washington RHME data. And uh, in the United States, the first state's uh, stay home order uh, uh, started is from March 21. And the first stay home order ended is starts from um, April 25th. And our, our business measures from census small business survey, including the four measures. 
and uh, small business from census perspective means less than 500 employee or at least $1,000 revenue. And certain uh, sectors are excluded because of survey and there is an e uh, email based survey and they re-weighted it to uh, for the non-response buyers possibility. COVID data is from Johns Hopkins, as you know, <laughs> um, and the economic data from Department of Labor and ACS and Democrat from ACS, financial system from the Small Business Survey. And typically, we, oh, we this one it just shows uh, the first few basic measures using daily data. And the gray area shows the after the COVID, uh, after stay home order ended. And you see the, the red shows the work from home rate. Um, when the pandemic just started in the United States, started getting known everywhere, right? Um, the work from home rate is high. And when uh, the uh, stay home order started, the work from home rate is high. And then when stay home order started to end around April 25th, and the uh, stay home, uh, the work from home really dropped. But later on, with some pandemic, this is a caseload. Caseload rising again, the work from home rate started to gradually um, pick up again. This is just a purely de descriptive without controlling or any other factors. And the death rate, uh, as, as we know, is, is kind of uh, stable in a sense, typically ranging around one to 2%. This is summary statistics. Um, in America overall, um, based on the data we saw, is around 27% averagely for the work from home rate and the minimum ranging from only 5% to 56%. And those are the other, other measures. As you can see, the, the, the dates from March 21 to July 20th, and we don't have time to go through all the details, but yeah, those are just summary statistics, and there's more summary statistics from the business perspective. From the, move on quickly to findings, and uh, the first set is uh, showing some of the models, because um, we tested many, we're just showing some a few um, for the hypothesis number one. As we see, the after stay home order ended, the work from home rate actually goes up instead of going down. So you would think after stay home order, the mandate ends, you know, a lot of business will reopen with more people, it will be less people work from home. But after controlling for everything else, we actually see work from home rate is positive, goes up, uh, um, goes up by half a percentage point. And because the measure is uh, rate is less than one. So uh, yeah, after the stay home order ended, it goes by half a, from half percentage point after controlling every, the time effect to, to almost 2% increase. So, um, so the, 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 when we added the day, I mean, the time effect, we see the time effect is also uh, positive. So which means work from home rate goes up averagely by day, each day. Okay, by point, point oh three percentage point. And this one just based on model four, uh, uh, visualize the effect. And for hypothesis number two, we select a few models to show here as also shows that work from home rate does help to um, increase the percentage of businesses that have the cash flow for from one to two, one to four week range until uh, three plus months have no effect on small business that has no cash flow on hand, and it helps to increase operation avenue, and the uh, um, lower the temporary closure rate and lower the disruption in supply chain controlling for all the other you know time effect COVID pandemic economic and demographic as well as the business assistance. Uh, financial assistance. We uh, put the um, PPP, the Paycheck Protection uh, Policy here, just want to see, you can see the Paycheck Protection Policy does have the positive effect on business performance. And the, uh, this is, those is based on the mi mixed effect models, and it does shows the different from a linear model. And those just visualize the, 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 you know, the model we just shown. As you can see, the no cash flow has no effect, and the others have um, cash flow for longer period has a positive effect there. And those are visualized for the effect of for operation, operating re revenue, temporary closure, and disruption. And robustly check, we actually run totally 43 models, uh, ranging from adding different um, uh, specification in the variables and try alternative models. 
and fit, you know, try different effects and using different data uh, frame. Anyhow, so um, in, a good thing is the, our key findings are quite consistent across all the, all the 43 models. And also the key statistics um, like log likelihood, chi-square test and F-test are, are showing pretty good results. So that's our Surabasnik check part. For the discussion part, we're mainly talking about certain uh, concerns mentioned on, on in, in, in the literature. And first of all, the COVID-19, you know, um, is, if COVID-19 give us uh, a, a specialized expedite effect for our adoption of the telework practice. And that could be a, you know, um, teleworking or work from home could be a creative distraction. If that's the case, it could really shift uh, work from home become a new norm. If that's the case, then work for work from home ready companies may be further, you know, adopting work from home to carrying the, you know, the wave better is important. For others, um, the companies that is not necessarily work from home ready, maybe, you know, try seeking some new um, solutions, do some more viable approach. As we see a lot of the retail businesses you know start to do you know de delivery or cur curbside order all those kind of uh, new approaches which you never used before so new solutions to adapt to the new norm could be useful and an, a very important part of this from HR perspective you know a lot of employers hesitant and to adopt a, um, work from home even if they're uh, work from home ready mainly because they are concerned about the control surveillance so um, a, a new HR you know or labor relationship policies or a practice would be very important as well as a career path concerns from employee perspective. Often we see, you know, um, you, if, if, you, if you don't see, if you don't appear in office, you probably have less chance to be promoted. So in, in that case, um, the new policy would be a need to adapt to that as well as the uh, psychosocial sociological distance as we know that a, a lot of the psychological or uh, psychiatristic um, appointments uh, numbers goes up during the COVID. So those need to be adapted to that as well. Of course, the COVID-19, uh, if, if we're just work from home, there is a huge implication in urban planning and city ex externalities, the industrial location transformation, and as well as a huge implication on digital divide, as you know, now the, the becomes uh, the divide will be very wide between those who have, have the technology and skills and those who have not. So our conclusion will be from the basic theoretical um, perspective, we see work from home has some rational potential attractiveness. And our empirical shows work from home uh, could be a new norm based on the uh, the data shows after stay home order ended the COVID-19, um, the work from home rate stays high, actually rise instead of uh, drop after controlling pandemic economic and demographic conditions. And we see work from home also helps the uh, small business mitigate the negative pan pandemic shock. And so uh, certain policy and practice of promoting work from home might be needed. Um, as a and concluding point, since we do more focus on small businesses, and we on we know small business on the one hand is very vulnerable. On the other hand, they're nimble and creative. So, as historically shows, small business could be the vanguard for a new creative destruction. So we hope that is the case in this pandemic as well. So that concludes my presentation, and here's my Thank contact you. means. Very interesting and very relevant for uh, the months to come because I believe with the pandemic, uh, the way we work is going to change uh, mm -hmm. tremendously. So I have a few comments, questions for you. Uh, number yes. one is related to whether there is a way at all to include uh, the role of the economic sector you belong to because that work, on, uh, work from home aspect differs very much based on the kind of uh, uh, you know, sector you belong to. Just to give you an example, yep. among my neighbors here, some are dentists and they have their own business. As you can imagine, uh, they really had a tough time because of COVID because no patients will come. On the other hand, I have other uh, neighbors who already work from home for a bank or a company, insurance company. So for them, it was no different whatsoever with the pandemic. They already had that kind of setting. So right. eventually, including right. the sector aspect. Secondly, um, 
Is there a way at all from the data you have to figure out whether there is a difference in the effect based on whether you own the company or whether you work for the company? I have mm -hmm. in mind that the owner of the company right. mm -hmm. really would like to see people back in the office, whereas the staff eventually is more reluctant for uh, reasons you have made clear. Mm -hmm. And then very last point, at the end of the day, it seems to me the, the structure you're using is a defensive. Uh, yeah. Yet you yep. did not mention it. You did not say it anywhere. So you may want to eventually right. make it clear and eventually also remind us if anyone has done defensive on questions right. which are somewhat related to you. But right. think fantastic work. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Let me just quickly um, address that. First of all, for the sector. Yes, actually, when I initially started that, I did um, focus on the sector. Unfortunately, um, we, we did use a try different set of sectors, but unfortunately, we did not see a major difference in, in the sector. Part of the reason is that, um, you know, the data when we, when I did the paper, I did that in at end of July. So yes, yeah, you can see the data ends at uh, end of July. So the data limit, um, the time period is, is limited with the sector data is actually weekly data and that data ends end of June so we have limited data points in a sense for particularly for certain sectors don't even have enough points and even for the major sector we did not see um, a very significant effect that is why I did not present here however now with new data coming in you know we, when we do uh, you know, when, I, when I do the test again we might see the difference actually that's what I expected to see also um, for the difference between owner on uh, operating owner owner or, or, or just the owner, um, they actually this data doesn't allow us to, to have that. If there is micro um, data and some of micro data has the um, by the different kind of owner, but they do not have work from home um, re related or uh, they don't have actually those data are not really as new as this COVID period. So I don't have that data yet for the um, uh, yeah, the difference, difference, particular spatial difference in difference. That's what I'm going to try next. Actually, I never tried a spatial different difference yet. So if anybody interested in working with me on that, I'll, I'll be very happy to to work with you on that. So well, it's new to me. That, uh, yeah. The next presenter is a leading scholar on spatial defensive. So you need to speak oh, with cool. Michael uh, at some point. On that okay. particular aspect, if you don't mind, thing, one, one idea. Uh, you know, traditionally in spatial defensive, we've looked at questions of geographical proximity to see how eventually uh, observations connect with each other. Right. Because, because, the, because of the way we even have the meeting today, maybe the geographical proximity is not very much what matters. It could instead be the network that you, uh, that you right. have. And that network is not necessarily dependent on geographical distance. So anyway, it's maybe something to look at if the spatial defensive is uh, right. something you want to go into. Let's okay. collect more questions and comments for Ting, please. Uh, someone is speaking, I'm not so sure. I hear a bit of noise, but it's not very clear. If you have a question or comment for Ting, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Ting. Uh, hello. I'm Claudia. I am a professor at West Virginia University. Um, Hi, I'm Anna. wondering, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with the, the data you used. Um, so I was wondering, did you account at all or can you account for like how um, creative the company is? So how quick they, they are um, adapt to, I don't know if there would be a measure for that, but I was just curious from, from what you found and discussed. Thank you for your good question. And I actually um, did test it on some of the, uh, there are some measures like a de delivery change and uh, measure method change. Yeah, so I, I, I did uh, um, initially did some models on that, but I did not see very uh, clear impact on that. Part of the reason is among all small business, those using the delivery measure change is a relative a very small pr fraction. So that's why, um, and also, as I said, at this moment, this, uh, the big business data is weekly data. So the data points are a whole lot less. So that could be another factor. Once I use a newer measure and particularly, I mean, newer data with more data, particularly with all pandemic going deeper right now, right? And a particular, or maybe in, or even a few more months with more data points and more adap adaption going on, we might see the difference. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Okay, Anna, thank you so much for the question. And Ting, thank you so much again. Very interesting presentation, very relevant. And we would like to hear uh, the new version whenever you have the new data, Ting. Okay. Thank you so, very much, Sandy. In, uh, in six months from now or something. Great. <laughs> yes. So we are moving from Baltimore to Purdue, West Lafayette in Indiana. And the second presentation is by Professor Michael Delgado. And the title is going to be Peer Effects in Fertility and Sun Preference of China. So why don't we give uh, the co-host privileges to Mike. Okay. Who's can you make that happen? Okay, good. Um, I think it's sharing, is that correct? I see your screen, we are good. you're good to go, Mike. Thank you so much. All right. Um, all right, thank you very much, um, everybody, for having me here. Um, and thank you, Ting, for that presentation. That, that, that was really interesting and very timely. Um, okay, um, so this, this paper is, um, a paper I'm working on uh, with one of my graduate students, um, Edie Yao. Um, and as you can see from the title, um, this paper is about peer effects. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize, uh, this is sort of right in the area of a big interest of um, mine and hers, and that's using observational data to try to um, combine with spatial econometrics to try to understand, uh, identify, and estimate peer effects. Um, so you may have seen a lot of research lately um, using experimental data to get at peer effects. Um, we're actually trying to use spatial econometrics uh, to get at those same things. Um, so, okay, um, I just want to kind of jump right into our research interest. Um, the paper is about China. The paper is about um, whether and to what extent um, so-called peer effects are influencing the decision of families to have a second child um, and whether or not to have a son. Um, I do want to just note here that these two questions um, are obviously related, but they are distinct. Okay, so the first research question is specifically, do Chinese households decide to have a second child in part because their peers do? Um, the second question is, do Chinese households choose to have a son in part because their peers do? Um, and this is, um, so just to clarify the, the distinction here, choosing to have a son does not mean that the second child is a son. Um, this could be that any of the children um, is a son. Um, so a lot of things to unpack here. Um, obviously, peer effects, what do we mean by that? What's the definition? Um, I'll try to go through a little bit of the relevant uh, culture and policies, um, the socioeconomic importance, and then, of course, try to get into what we find in our analysis. Um, so I want to give you a definition of peer effects. I, I think this is a pretty standard definition. Um, this is a quote that comes from Brock and Durloff, um, and I chose Brock and Durloff 2001 because <clears throat> um, they are focused on um, peer effects in a binary choice problem, and that's what we have here. So um, this is sort of the most relevant, but I, I do think the, the definition is pretty general. So, um, quote, the utility or payoff an individual receives from a given action depends directly on the choices of others in that individual's reference group. So the key phrase there is that it depends on the choices of others. So not the characteristics of others, um, but the actual choices of others. And so if you're familiar with spatial econometrics, I mean, this is inherently a spatial econometric model. Okay, so that uh, in a spatial econometric model, you would have Y uh, on the left-hand side, you would have Y on the right-hand side of the regression, of course, multiplied by the spatial matrix. And so you'd end up with sort of the outcome of my neighbors or my peers on the right-hand side. So that's inherently um, kind of a model of peer effects. Um, and so theoretically, there's a lot of ways that, um, you know, peer effects might manifest uh, different behaviors. Um, often we're thinking of some kind of uh, conformity in behavior. Okay, so from the same paper, they say that um, when these spillovers are positive, in the sense that the payoff for a particular action is higher for one agent when others behave similarly, the presence of social interactions will induce a tendency for conformity in behavior across members of a reference group. So what that basically means is, um, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, households in different counties in China. Um, so you may observe different counties and you might observe different rates of uh, second child births or different uh, uh, male female uh, ratios. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. We're going to try to focus on, you know, these positive um, spillovers such that 
when more people choose to have a second child or more people choose to have a son, then if I live in that environment, then I'm less, I feel less comfortable if I deviate from that behavior and therefore you're going to see um, these kind of clustering of behavior. And that works in the opposite direction. So if you're in a place where fewer people want to have a second child, then um, I might feel a little bit awkward having a second child. So I'm more likely to choose to, to only have one child. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't think I need to talk for too long about um, the preference for male offspring. Um, I think that's pretty well known. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, important traditions in China that um, is certainly not true of China uh, only, but of other um, places, India, uh, South Korea, for example, or other um, similar cultures in this regard. So families traditionally have a preference for sons. Um, and now the one child policy in China that everybody um, I think is aware of makes it very difficult to follow that tradition. Um, and so what you get is, you know, a lot of um, sex selection and ultimately that leads to a high gender imbalance. And so just to kind of give some motivation, I mean, it, that I, I think it's certainly interesting to study in its own right um, from a sociological perspective. Um, but, you know, as economists, I mean, these things lead to real economic consequences as well. So there's a lot of reasons that we might want to study these things. <coughs> um, and we're certainly not the first to study them, um, but we are, I think, um, of the first, at least in economics, to really rigorously look at peer effects and how peer, peer effects play a role um, in um, fertility within the household. Um, so some of the consequences that have been documented for uh, the gender imbalance, and so increases in crime rates, um, increase in spread of disease, um, discrimination against females in the labor market, um, increased trafficking of women as brides. Um, and then, of course, that's this is all related to the problem of uh, missing women. Um, and so that's related to sex selective abortion, um, even though that's um, Technically, that's illegal uh, in China. That still um, was quite rampant. rampant. Um, female infanticide, adoption, um, giving up of adoption of, of female children, um, and also hiding of females from officials. Um, and that's, that's particularly important um, in China. So you, you have to have a citizenship registration, and that's sort of, um, <clears throat> that basically says, um, uh, you know, where you live and what type of uh, public resources you can get. So whether or not you can go to school, you have to have registration and then be registered in a particular area to go to those particular schools or receive health care. Um, so it's a huge problem if you're born and you're never registered and you don't have that registration. Um, now, um, I sort of want to zero in a little bit here. Um, that one child policy is actually um, a little bit more um, complex than I think most people realize. Um, so that was a 1979 policy. Um, but in 1984, um, that was relaxed a little bit. So if both parents themselves were an only child, then they would qualify uh, for two children if they would like. Um, from the, since the mid 80s, um, there was the, op the option for different provinces to adopt the so-called 1.5 child policy. And that policy said that um, in rural areas, a family could have a second child if the first child was a girl. Um, and uh, most of the adoptions of that policy occurred before 2003. Um, in 2014, that was um, relaxed again. So if only one parent was an only child, then the family would be eligible for two children. Um, and then I think most people were aware in 2016, um, there was a lot of attention that the, the one child policy was completely relaxed. Um, and so now you could say it's a two-child policy if, if you'd like. Um, we're not directly studying any particular part of this policy, but we're sort of um, sort of focused on this uh, 1.5 child policy in particular. So that would allow um, families to have a second child if they had a first girl. So we're going to have some um, control variables in the model to sort of help us um, identify the, the, uh, the families who sort of qualified under that policy. Um, okay, just to give you a little bit of the, the data here, so, um, uh, so in the 2010 uh, census from China, so the sex ratio at birth um, was pretty high, um, 1.16, 1.19 um, males to female in urban and rural China. Um, and the World Economic Forum, uh, this is in 2020, ranks China uh, last out of 153 countries in terms of sex ratio at birth. 
Um, <clears throat> so, so an important issue, I think, as um, many people are aware. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the econometric models we're using, particularly um, noting again, we're using observational data to try to disentangle some of these different effects. Um, so if you read the literature on peer effects or you know, network effects, um, you know, they'll use words like network structure. Um, this is basically distance. Uh, it's basically space. Um, the traditional spatial econometric models didn't really stipulate exactly um, how that uh, W matrix was created, although often it was geographic. Um, but it, can really, it, it really coincides nicely with these network models. Um, and really what's happened here is, um, you know, the models, the spatial econometric model has often now just been grounded in some kind of game theory that allows um, uh, one to establish the micro foundations of that model. And that ultimately helps us have, have confidence in identification. Um, for example, that the, the spatial parameter we're estimating is a peer effect. Um, now, what, what you get with observational data, and, and you know, one reason that people try to do experiments um, to get at these things, with observational data, obviously, you get an equilibrium. Okay, this is a system of simultaneous equations model, um, and so that's where you know I'm, you know, if I'm a household that's choosing, you know, my our our fertility decisions based on what we expect others in our community are going to be doing, um, and vice versa, and so ultimately, uh, in the end, we get an observed equilibrium, and so econometrically, then our job is to disentangle um, that equilibrium. Now, as it turns out, if you read into this literature, one of the things that I think is um, really quite fascinating and really uh, kind of drew me into this area is that um, there are certain uh, nonlinearities that are in general inherent to the spatial structure. Um, and in our case in particular, beyond that, we're dealing with a binary choice probability model, so there's nonlinearities there. Um, these nonlinearities actually facilitate identification. Um, so where in you know, typical linear models, identification might fail when we're trying to understand we're trying to separate some of these equilibrium um, structures, um, we actually have an advantage using the spatial uh, structure. Um, and, and in this case, um, in addition to the spatial structure, the, the binary choice probability function. Um, as I described the model, I just want to make it clear. So we're using a group model. Um, you know, obviously the peer-to-peer -peer network is sort of like the, the, the gold standard for doing a network analysis. Um, but at the same time, you know, very few um, data sets really have that built in. So um, we're using a group model defined at the county level. Um, we feel pretty comfortable with that actually. So um, in China, cities are tend to be bigger than counties and tend to be bigger than villages. And so actually a lot of local economic activity happens at the county level. Um, that's particularly true in rural areas. Um, but you know, a lot of local government would be situated at the county level. Um, you know, a lot of restaurants and businesses would be at the county level. And so um, that's where a lot of that activity occurs. And so that's going to be the sort of the group structure that, that we're looking at. Um, okay, now, um, there's a lot of literature here that has talked about, you know, what, what do we need to control for if we're going to identify um, something that we can call a peer effect. Um, and so generally, this is laid out that we have to be able to control for so-called contextual effects. And these are characteristics of the group. So, um, for example, the average level of education or income in the group. And that's in recognition that, um, you know, different characteristics of the group might give rise to um, sort of different beliefs or different uh, perspectives of different groups. Um, for example, whether it's, you know, uh, how important it is to, to try to have a son versus, um, you know, um, just um, having a, a surprise, whatever the child is going to be. Um, and so different individuals will operate differently uh, in different groups. Um, and so, of course, that could give rise to what appears to be equilibrium behavior, where you see certain groups have higher incidences of, um, you know, male children born versus other groups with more female children born. Um, but that need not be an equilibrium peer effect. That simply is based on different group characteristics. So we have to control for these contextual effects. Correlated effects, which are group level common factors. So, you know, different groups will be subject to different laws, regulations, maybe even differences in, in culture. Um, and so, you know, in China, often I think the province level is sort of a, a, a way that people sort of divide differences in culture and, and local laws and regulations. And so we're going to be 
controlling for these uh, correlated effects, these common factors um, at the province level. And then of course there are individual effects. I mean, everyone has uh, their own different characteristics and that certainly um, plays an important role um, in decisions as well. Um, okay, so this is gonna be a binary choice model. Um, it's structured from a utility function. Um, and so the coding here, this is a, the, the utility function for the household. The coding for Y is one, if you have a second child or in the case of our second question, if you have a son, um, the opposite coding is a negative one. It, it's, um, we're sort of following the derivations from these other papers, but it, it's really just about the scaling of the parameters that are estimated. So um, it, it doesn't really matter if you wanna use a traditional you know, logic model where you have a one zero, that, that would be fine as well. Um, so the components of this utility function is, um, X is a vector of individual characteristics. And so these are the individual factors um, in X alpha. Now, these other three terms, um, here, W, X, um, and uh, W, M, and U, G, these terms are, all make up the different social components. So if you're familiar with spatial econometric models, the, the W, X will be like the Durbin term in the spatial Durbin model. Um, and if with a row standardized W, which is the spatial vector, um, that's gonna be the average group characteristics. Uh, I'm gonna come back to W, M in a minute because that's, that's our peer effect uh, part. And then UG is gonna be the, the group specific factors, that, the, the correlated effects. And then if we assume a, a logistic distribution, this ultimately will give us a logistic model. Um, so that term there for the, the peer effects. So what's going on is um, there's a lot of different ways this can be, the model can be set up. There's dynamic peer effect models, there are static models. Um, it, it to a large extent depends on the data that's available. Um, we're using a static model. So what that really means is um, households are forming an expectation as to what other, the decision that others are gonna be making. Um, and that's simply just a reflection of um, the fact that, you know, in a static model, everything is sort of happening simultaneously. Um, and so when everyone is making an expectation of what others in their peer group are going to do, then that leads to this equilibrium phenomenon where, um, you know, the equilibrium is solved and when everybody's expectation sort of coincides with the behavior of what others are doing, right? So I make my optimal choice given my best expectation of what others are doing. They're making their optimal choice given their best expectation of what I'm doing. And that all has to be solved simultaneously. Um, so that's what M is. It's a vector of expectations about the decisions of others. And so when we multiply W times M, that's pulling out the, 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 the average expect, uh, expectation of what others in my reference group are going to be doing. And that's basically where our, our kind of spatial lag term if, uh, is going to be. Um, there's algebra here that, you know, under a logistic function, when we derive that expectation, it's Solving M is the, is the solution of this tan H function. So notice that we have the individual and the um, contextual and correlated effects here. Um, and so solving M um, depends on unknown parameters of the utility function. And so we have to solve all these things simultaneously. Um, this is what the probability functions look like. Uh, they're just um, logit, um, logit probability functions. M is in there. Again, M is a function itself of these alphas and deltas. And so we have basically an iterative maximum likelihood estimator where in each step we're solving M for the optimal expectation given the parameters alpha, and then we're solving um, for the optimal probabilities, and then we're cycling through that so that we get sort of an equilibrium M built in um, to our best estimate of the parameters. Um, okay, so um, Hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, the, the we have two samples that we're using here um, for the different questions. And the basic difference um, between these um, samples is, um, so the survey year from the China family panel studies is 2016. Um, in the first case, we're focusing, now we're, we're actually subsetting whole households, um, but the, the main criterion for selection here is that the wife in 2016, the survey year, is between age 45 and 54 um, and has one to two children for the first question. And that allows us to look at um, basically a woman who, or a family for the woman who has already basically completed her fertility period. Um, and then for the second question, we're not restricting only to one or two children. Most households in the uh, sample do have only one or two children. There are a few that have more than, than two children. And then we're specifically, again, looking at a sample of households where 
um, the wife has um, uh, completed fertility, um, and then just looking to see if any of those children uh, are a son and see if there's some peer effects associated. Um, okay, I'll, um, I want to kind of go through this a little bit quickly, but just to give you a sense of the variables we're controlling for. We're, so we're controlling for education of the mother and the father, um, family income, whether or not the family are uh, farmers, or if they're, whether or not they're in a rural area. Um, if the first child is a girl, um, when, we're, when we're focusing on our um, first research question, um, if they have an agricultural res registered residence, qualify for the 1.5 child policy, the mother's age of having a first child, um, and then if they live with the mother and father-in-law, which um, this is the mother's uh, mother and father-in-law, so this is with the husband's parents. Um, and that, there's a lot of kind of social pressure often associated there. Contextual characteristics, so this would be the average education and income of peers, um, percent of peers with firstborn daughters, the, the mother's age of having the first child, and the percent of the peers living with in-laws. Um, the samples are a little bit different from the two research questions, but largely the same, so I want to get to the results. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we basically consider six different models, and we're basically putting in, we have the peer effects, we have the, the individual controls, the contextual effects, and the correlated effects, and so we're sort of seeing, putting those uh, variables, uh, those types of variables in um, sequentially. Um, the table is split over uh, two pages here, um, so I'll sort of go through those back and forth. In the first two models, in model one, we don't have, we don't have peer effects in the first two models. Um, in model one, we have only individual controls, and then in model two, um, we add individual and contextual controls. So if I go to the bottom of the table, you can see that in column two. Um, then we, in three and four, we added the peer effects, and then in five and six, you can see at the bottom, province fixed effects, yes, we've added in the, uh, the correlated effects. All that is to say that model six is sort of our preferred model where we're estimating our peer effects, controlling for the individual contextual and cor correlated effects. <coughs> um, so when looking at the decision to have a second child, we do find um, a significant positive and significant um, uh, peer effect parameter. We need to translate that into marginal effects for a probability change, so I'll come to that in just a moment. Same basic regression setup, decision to have a son. When we include um, the individual, the contextual, and correlated effects together, the peer effect is not significant. So we see some evidence of uh, peer effects when we, for example, exclude the correlated or exclude the contextual effects. Um, so there, there clearly are some equilibrium type patterns, but those disappear when we control for um, these other factors. Let me translate these into probabilities, particularly for the first question about whether or not to have a second child. So there's sort of a complete change and a marginal change. So the complete change would be um, all of your peers go from having only one child to all of your peers having two children, okay? So our estimate of 0.388 implies that that change would induce a 35% uh, uh, increase in the probability that, um, that the individual chooses to have um, a second child. A more marginal change would be that one more of your peers has a second child. So on average, we have 19 neighbors. 11 of them have a second child, so about 60%. Now, if one more of those neighbors had a second child, then that would be 60, move to 63%. And our, est our estimate implies that about a 1.8% increase in the probability that um, an individual would have a second child if one of your neighbors on average um, had a, a, a second child. Um, for having a son, um, that was insignificant. Primarily that's driven by the contextual and individual factors. Um, to do the same kind of complete change calculation, even though it's insignificant, it's only a negative 3.22% for that complete change. Um, so in other words, it's, it's not economically significant in addition to not being statistically significant. Um, okay, I'll more or less wrap up there. So um, we've tried to disentangle um, some of these complex um, social um, behaviors with kind of a structural utility model, um, a spatial econometric model, um, 
can disentangle some of these factors that might otherwise give rise to what appears to be or what is equilibrium behavior but, but is not necessarily a, a social interaction. And we found that peer effects seem to matter in the decision to have a second child, uh, but not in the decision to have a son. Um, future work, you know, this is sort of ongoing. Um, looking at multiple equilibrium is sort of a big issue in, in some of these um, models of binary choice. Um, beyond this particular project, you know, looking at dynamics or looking at peer-to-peer -peer networks, if that would be available, could be something of interest. Um, so I'll stop there, and if um, there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those for you. Mike, thank you so much. And as usual, your work is super interesting, very relevant, and very technical. So I really love it. A uh, couple of questions for you. Um, first one is actually on the clarification. I have to admit, Mike, until you presented the, the data uh, and really the fact that you have three levels, the, the individual level, and then the peer effect level, and then the county level, I have to admit it wasn't fully clear to me. So maybe I didn't catch it, I, I don't know. But you may want to make it super explicit from the beginning that observation I is indeed the individual or the family, and then you have those two additional effects. Once okay. that's clear, I think then it's much easier to introduce your WM and your W, was it WX? Uh, why, I forgot. Uh, so that's the first point. Second point. Um, I think definitely a lot of uh, special econometric works is going in that direction whereby you have more than one uh, lag of your dependent variable. And here, including those two uh, kind of IRKs, if you want, peer effect and, and, and geographical uh, location based on the, on the province you belong to is, is absolutely wonderful. Now, I, I'm not a specialist of that, I have to admit, that specific aspect of special econometrics, I haven't looked at it uh, very clearly, but two elements. Number one, you may want to update us a little bit for sort of us like me who haven't followed the, that point of the literature with respect to where we're at on that point. Uh, the only reference that I'm aware of along those lines is some work which is now quite old by uh, Lacombe, uh, Proha, and Piras. And I just don't really know how the whole thing has evolved. So eventually refresh us on, on the literature in, on, on those uh, techniques, that would be wonderful. Secondly, um, the one element I'm quite curious about, and I think you touched upon it, but still I'd like to ask it to you. Uh, as you know, um, Le Sage and Pace have come up with that very clear uh, approach in order to disentangle the direct and indirect effect of any of, of the covariates that you have in your model, as long as you have a W of Y. When you presented the results here, I saw that the individual level effect were there, I saw a coefficient associated to the peer effect, and I saw several coefficients associated to the effect uh, from the county. It, this is a part which is a little bit unclear to me. Shouldn't we end up with, let's say, n covariates at the, at the individual level, then n covariates which are based on the peer effect, and then n covariate, uh, by covariate I mean actually a marginal effect, sorry, and then n marginal effect which are based on the county level part. Isn't it what we have, or maybe you have it and I did not get it? Um, so, I'm not, I, I'm not quite sure which... Um, oh, let, let me say it in a different way. If you start with a very basic spatial lag model, right, you must be yeah. aware of the work of uh, Le Sage and Pace indicating, uh, let's say in your model you have W of Y and you have three X's, the marginal effect you're going to end up measuring will be uh, the direct effect, also three X's, so three marginal effects, as well as three indirect effects, which are basically, you know, capturing the full effect with a, with a peer effect. Here yeah. in your case, because you have three levels in your hierarchy, I was expecting to see three groups of marginal effects. Uh, and, I see. Yeah. And I did not, so I'm a bit confused on that. Could you clarify that for me? Yeah, um, so what, what you could uh, do, what you're referring to is essentially to say, um, if uh, an X variable changes, then that's going to update this um, M equilibrium. And then that M equilibrium is gonna update um, the uh, utility or the probability. And yeah. so then that change in X would give you sort of a direct effect, which would come through, um, say the first term here. Um, and it would also give you, you know, through the, the contextual effects, and you could also update that equilibrium through the peer effect. Exactly. Um, that, that's absolutely, um, that's a great point. Um, so the only thing that we, and we haven't looked at calculating that at this point yet. The only thing we're basically looking at is 
how this change in the, the gamma uh, parameter corresponds to a change in a peer effect um, when one more person added, say, a, a second uh, child. So basically that is to say, um, those different effects you're talking about are in there. We haven't calculated any marginal effects with respect to the, the X's yet. Yeah, so because the, the, the underlying question I have is, let's say your focus is on education, right? You're gonna have basically three betas related to education, the one of the individual, the one from the peer effect, and the one from the, from the county. So my question ended up being, which one of those three really matters the most? Is it really that peer effect that affects you? Maybe for education is mostly the one at the individual level, but what if it's a different covariate, uh, let's say income, Maybe the peer effect income is the one that matter more than the individual versus the county. But anyway, it's fantastic work. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, very, very technical, very interesting, Mike. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, good comment. We, Thank you. Yeah, sure, of course. Why don't we collect a few more comments and questions for Mike, please? Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, Michael. Hi, how are you? It's Catalina Herrera speaking. Uh, uh, hi. How are you doing? Uh, Good. So, ha haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, it's very interesting work. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, related to spatial econometrics, but I, I work on fertility and, and I was curious about these results. So I have a couple of questions. Is it possible to define the peer effects at the village level? Or, or you are, con I mean, I, I don't know the data. Is it is it that possible? Because I think that that will make more sense for that type of fertility decisions. And the second is, is this type of identification in a spatial econometrics, is my understanding, uh, solving the reflection problem that we have with the peer effects? And um, I mean, probably you can answer all of them. And then I was thinking more in identification, what we, I mean, but more a standard way to think about will be to use probably this stagger policy to identify changes in the, in the peer effects. I don't know if that will be also something that you would like to implement with these matrices. I, I don't know if that, because you are controlling for the policies, right? But definitely, um, and this is cross-section, right? So you probably, you will, you will be, you will be, yeah, you will be limited there. But I was curious if, if you can see, given that you were thinking in these dynamic effects, if you can have like a, this policy that has been changing over time. And given that you have the fertility history of these women for the older ones, probably you can kind of trace, you know, like uh, the number of children that they have had, you know, over, over time. Yeah, um, those are great comments. Um, I'll say for the last one, um, yeah, that's, those are really good ideas and we can look into that. Um, the, for the first two, so um, it would be ideal to look at a village level. I think ultimately for this data, our sample size is too small to, for that to be reliable. And so the county level is sort of kind of the next best um, kind of thing. Um, although I would say in China, I mean, it is pretty common for people to interact, um, you know, it, at the county level. Um, so it's, I think, not a terrible approximation um, in that sense. Um, and yes, this does solve the reflection problem. So I, I didn't really get to say much about it, but I did say um, something here about the spatial structure and nonlinearities. Um, that's, a, that's actually what a, a really large body of this literature has gone into is actually to, to verify under quite general conditions that the spatial structure um, does solve the reflection problem. Okay. So that's, that's a huge result in this uh, the okay. theoretical literature. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, but these are, it's through these nonlinearities, right? The identification comes through the nonlinearities? Um, yes. Now, in, in our particular case, there's two types of nonlinearities. So one is simply in the probability function, and that's mm -hmm. an, an identification comes there. But more generally, in the spatial uh, network literature, um, so essentially heterogeneity in, um, the, in the network structure. So if in a group model, it's, it's different numbers of people in different groups. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's just simply saying that uh, not all of we don't all share the same friends. So actually, quite general data structures um, on networks, either peer-to-peer -peer or group structure, that that spatial structure actually translates into nonlinearities that are sufficient for identifying for breaking that reflection problem. Um, and it's it's a quite general result actually. So I think um, um, pretty pretty exciting, um, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, one more thing okay. to, to, to my mind, Mike, is it turned out I, uh, when working with a visiting scholar here uh, and a paper on China, 
it turned out that he made it clear to me that China has roughly eight or, or, or nine uh, local languages, uh, which are basically another kind of hierarchy uh, uh, that you could be thinking about. If you believe it is relevant for the, for the question you have, I'm very happy to have him send you those, those data. Um, it could eventually provide a different clustering, say, than the, the province level you have, like much bigger special units, but it could be worth to see whether that somewhat closer similarity in local culture captured through the local language uh, is, is another element that matters in, uh, in that uh, um, decision of having another child. So yeah, no, us, yeah I'd love to, uh, to get in contact with him. Um, there are a lot of different dialects, um, some much stronger uh, than others, um, and that's, that is related to the region and the, and the um, local culture. So um, that's definitely something it would be great to talk to him about and, and talk um, and, and see if that can help us take this further. Yeah, this side, he, send me an email if you feel it can be of some help. Okay, with that, I think we're going to close it here. So thank you so much again to the two presenters today. Very interesting talk by Professor Delgado and Professor Zhang. And thank you so much to everyone for attending. And I look forward to seeing you next week in the same location and at the same time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for thank the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. <laughs>